I'm here this afternoon in San Antonio with uh, Conrad Elst from Belgium. He's going to be speaking tonight for G416 Patriots. Uh, I've just met you and I find it fascinating that you're from Belgium and you have a tremendous wealth of uh, study and information about the country of India. How or what drew you your attention to India? Well, I was looking for the truth as a young guy. Uh, so, um, well, gradually I was drawn to uh, Oriental philosophies. I studied both Chinese and Hindi Sanskrit. And um, so I got into that philosophy and I was in India for a postgraduate course of philosophy. When I discovered the whole, uh, what is called their communal situation, that is to say, the relation between the Hindu and Muslim communities. So this was the time of the Salman Rushdie affair, when this book, The Satanic Verses, was being banned. And then I discovered what the background of it was and I started studying that, did my PhD thesis about it. Uh, but. Um, from there on, of course, I also had to deal with the problem of Islam, so I studied Islam properly. So what kind of time frame, what years would this have been? Well, for me personally, it was around 1990. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and when we think of India here in Texas, uh, we don't think of Islam. We think of Hindu and Buddhist and other religions. A variety of religions but Islam's not one that comes to mind and so you I think you've somewhat focused on the history of how that came into India would you share some well um, Islam of course came from Arabia as you know 7th century Arabia and uh, within a very short time span it conquered a large part of the world so the Middle East almost immediately after Muhammad's death in 632. Then all the way up to Spain, um, 702 thereabouts they arrived in Spain. Similarly in the eastern direction, they um, had a naval invasion near what is now Mumbai uh, in 636, four years after Muhammad's death. That uh, failed. Then they had a number of land invasions from Mesopotamia to Sindh, the southern part of what is now Pakistan. So they, uh, a number of them failed until finally in 712, Mohammed bin Qasim broke through and uh, established a province there of the uh, Umayyad Caliphate, capital in Damascus. Mm, okay. And how did that impact the country in that time frame? Well, in most of India they hardly noticed. Uh, life went on as before. Uh, it is very probable that it influenced the choice by Shankaracharya uh, of the four abbeys dominating his own monastic order. That is to say he founded a monastic order that is now omnipresent in India and so he did not give it one center but four in the four corners of the country three of them are north, east uh, and south they are as planned but then in the west he wanted to set up one in Hinglaj on the western um, riverside of the Indus River which at that time had been conquered by uh, Mohammed bin Qasim and so instead he put it a little less to the west uh, namely in Dwarka in Gujarat that's about the only immediate uh, impact I can see on Hindu civilization there was no writing about what is Islam you know no analysis of why it is a problem uh, there only was this military event of conquest and then attempts at reconquest. When they infiltrated that land, that region, was there a lot of massacre? Yes, 
and um, there was a lot of massacre but that of course you could still put down to uh, the military phase of conquest you see after that they set up a regime that uh, was admittedly very intolerant but nevertheless the object of that regime was not genocide it was simply to establish the power of Islam and then gradually convert everyone to put pressure on the population to convert Okay, we'll roll forward to today. What is the influence of Islam in India today? Well, the, the area that we've just talked about, Sindh, that is now part of Pakistan, an Islamic state. In fact, one that claims that ultimately Pakistan was founded by Mohammed bin Qasim, because after all, he is the founder of Islam in India. And so that was meant to be the state for Indian Muslims. Um, so that is very much an Islamic state where any insult of the Prophet is being forbidden, where uh, both Christians and Hindus are put under pressure to move out or to convert to Islam. So that's actually happening in the country of India today? Well, in that part of India that is officially occupied by Islam. In the rest of India what you have is uh, a big conflict. You see, originally Pakistan was intended to group together all the Indian Muslims, and, oh. India, and in India would have to welcome all the non Muslims from the area that became Pakistan. So that was not carried out. So the, most of the Muslim population within India stayed in India, and that has now become uh, nearly 200 million. So, uh, nearly 200 million? Yes. Muslims in India. In, in Pakistan, India. No. Okay, so Pakistan was originally set aside or, or cut off or whatever to be where all the Muslims would be and then the non Muslims in India. Yes. Wow, history lesson for me today. Um, and so in India, it's the India proper today, there's 200 million. Muslims? Yes. What's the population of India? 1.3 billion. Wow. That's a big country. <laughs> I hope. I hope. Oh gosh. So how do all the different, because when I visualize India, I see just a multitude of different religions. Because that is the way it's always been portrayed to me. Mm -hmm. And so how do they all interact? especially with Islam in particular being one that tolerates none other right. than their own. Well, um, Islam benefits in India, just like in America, of its status of religion and there's freedom of religion. And so what precisely the contents of each religion is, that is not being asked. And so you get uh, Islam preaching jihad, preaching the Sharia, the imposition of Islamic law. Uh, so on are the they are with, for example, Jainism, which is extremely non-violent. Yes, so Islam has the same rights. In fact, it has more rights. It has a number of privileges cornered by now. So Sharia, that can be extremely brutal, has the religious freedom in India to practice the brutality side? Well, um, Sharia is um, part of Indian law for Muslims. So you have four separate law systems oh. that apply to Hindus in the largest sense of the term, uh, Christians, Parsis and Muslims. Now, between those four Christians, uh, Parsis and Hindus, there is not much difference and also not much contention, they could be altered. Uh, whereas Sharia for Muslims is a very contentious issue. It is of course against the idea that India is a secular state. In a secular state by definition, all citizens have to obey the same laws. So that is already not uh, the case there. But Sharia does not apply to penal law, so there are no hands being chopped off. Or anything. Okay. For penal law they follow the same. Uh, but for marriage, divorce, inheritance and so on, it is Sharia that applies. Okay. i got to ask you, you're from Belgium. 
we here in the States hear about the migrant Muslims that have been moving and, and migrating and or let's say invading mm -hmm. a lot of the European and the countries over there. Mm -hmm. What is your first hand knowledge being from Belgium as to what is really going on, how it's impacting the the country you grew up in mm -hmm. and uh, your culture, your heritage and all of that with this coming in. Right, well um, what I remember from as a child, you see, when the first generation came in, well they were very little Islamized. They of course were very foreign in the sense that they knew no languages, not even Arabic usually, they were Berbers from uh, Morocco. They were superficially Islamized, so they celebrated uh, the Islamic holidays, uh, but um, they had not been on pilgrimage to Mecca or so usually okay. simply because they, they couldn't afford to. And certainly they had had no madrasa education, so they knew a few idealized stories about Muhammad. They didn't know the real Islam and they didn't care also. Because at that time they had the idea, well, if you go to Europe, it means you leave Islam behind. But as their numbers grow, they formed like separate societies mm -hmm. where Islam found a place. And that has gone on increasing. And so now the present generation, they all go to the Islamic equivalent of Sunday school. They all get seriously indoctrinated. Also, what plays is that when you say indoctrinated, yes. that means into Sharia. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, what also plays is that at the time when the first generation came, there was no television in Morocco or anything. So the countryside, where the Berber population it was culturally pretty distinct from the cities uh, that were more Arabicized and Islamized. And um, so their identity was mostly that ethnic culture. Now today, everybody, or at least every village in Morocco has television. They got strongly influenced by urban culture. And this is not only like Western influence, it is first of all, influence from like central Morocco. And um, so they have acquired the idea that their own Berber culture is backwards. They are shedding it in favor of pure Islam trying to be like the elite in Morocco. Meanwhile, over uh, in, in Belgium, for example, in France, well, you have second, third, fourth generation that have little connection with the Moroccan culture. So increasingly that ethnic component is disappearing and Islam is their only identity element. And so their sense of being Muslims is now much more stronger than 50 years ago. Are they changing the culture inside of your country to be an Islamic state? Well, um, so far I would not say that they have an influence on non-Muslims. They are not being uh, imitated in the sense that people aspire to be Muslims. You know, the way that, for example, there is a strong orientalization going on of Western culture. There's more and more influx of uh, Thai massage and yoga and, and Chinese medicine and stuff. Uh, you see, and that is, is, that is answering to a demand that comes from the Western population. There is no such thing at all vis-a-vis -vis Islam. Nobody wants Islam. But, of course, numerically it is more and more present. And you increasingly even get the situation that girls to be safe around Muslims are starting to, first of all, of course, dress more modestly than they used to do 20 years ago. But even to uh, cover their heads, there are such cases in Sweden and so on, the countries that are more, most Islamized, you already see that phenomenon. So there's an obvious impact that you can visually see when the Belgium people are beginning, to, uh, women are beginning to choose to dress more in the Islamic attire. Yes. 
and this probably is not by choice I wouldn't think but as you're saying for safety and safety being mm -hmm. because there is a I'm going to guess a growing trend in crime of rape that is for example there yes in the figures for Sweden which is now one of the first in the world for uh, rape uh, you see a clear uh, correspondence or correlation between the rising proportion of Muslims in the population and the rising uh, number of rapes. Okay. Your fellow citizens in Belgium mm -hmm. that are non-Muslim, do they want to see this continue in their country or is there a desire amongst your people to push back and to uh, bring back the old culture and ways before this invasion? Well, it's not like anyone has asked for Islam. And so increasingly, as there is more trouble emanating from the Islamic side, yes, people are tired of Islam. And you see, in spite of all the media propaganda that like the terror attacks that took place in Belgium uh, have nothing to do with Islam, nobody believes that. You see, that's only talk, all public figures, mouth, that kind of platitude. Nobody believes them anymore. But, you see, few people are active enough to really do anything about it. Do you think that there's a remnant of Belgians that would rise up to fight? Well, I wouldn't be surprised ultimately if it really came to that. Now, it is, however, possible that politicians come to their senses and prevent this from becoming necessary. So I have certainly not given up hope. I mean, there are many doomsday thinkers nowadays who fear the worst. No, it's not too late. Good. Okay, being in Belgium and having experience to <clears throat> whatever degree we would measure your impact of Islamization <laughs> mm -hmm. impact, and looking at America today and what you know is beginning to happen here mm -hmm. what are your words of wisdom for us? well the um, first thing to do is simply to speak the truth about Islam you see many Muslims who are now tempted by pure Islam uh, will think twice if they see that everybody around them has their number, you know, that, that Islam is not fooling anyone. Uh, that would make a big difference. Because That's of course, you see, Muslims are, after all, people like us. They are a bit indoctrinated, yes, yes, but it is not impossible to reach them. But for that, you see, it is very important to break through the spell that Islam has cast on them by just showing that the emperor has no clothes on, you see. Islam is no more than, you know, a, a simple delusion. Yeah. Your um, understanding of Islam, mm -hmm. um, and those that have lived in the countries that that's, that's it, that's all there is. Mm -hmm. What, when, the, when many of them have migrated to more of the Western culture, yes. Are you seeing the Western culture having any positive impact on pulling them away from their uh, ideology or do they just want to overthrow our Western culture? Well, uh, you have all kinds of scenarios. There are a number of ex-Muslims, people who consciously... Now that, I mean, that's an apostate. Yeah, well, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Of course, it's very dangerous for them. And so quite a few who become apple states while still over there seek to get away from there as quickly as possible. But then also in the Western environment, there are people who decide to leave Islam behind. Now, if you would encourage that trend, that would be a very good thing and that would really make a difference. But what Western authorities do is just the opposite is to confirm Islam, to, to praise Islam to the sky and to totally ignore these ex-Muslims. Nevertheless, I, I, I want to uh, draw your attention to the fact that at least there are ex-Muslims. You see, 30 years ago, during this Salman Rushdie affair, he was on his own. 
He was supported by most Western writers. That, yes, and I'm afraid that that today would not even be true anymore. Many Western writers would sort of be on the Islamic side, be something compromising. But on the other hand, many more Muslims have come forward with a similar message. And so now most Western countries have societies of ex-Muslims, often anonymous, you know, only few who really speak out publicly, but they are there. And so that marks an important trend, though I'm afraid that as yet it is still very small. But, you know, ultimately there is a race going on in the Muslim world between, on the other hand, expansion, more money, more privileges, more institutionalization in hitherto non-Muslim countries. But on the other hand, you have people outgrowing Islam. At the same time, we do have people that are converting to Islam. Yes. What do you believe to be the drawing factor yes. for people? Well, mainly two. You see, one is um, conversion upon marriage, or that there are many thousands of cases. Um, women, strictly speaking, don't have to convert when they marry a Muslim, but they have to raise their children as Muslims. So you yes. see, she herself is not really important, it's the children who are important. Mm -hmm. If they For divorce, he gets the children, she can't. Yes, we'll come to that. Okay. Um, so, that's her situation. A man, of course, who wants to marry a Muslim woman, he has to convert. And, you see, like, in, in my surroundings, I see several men who have converted, who keep it a secret for their uh, former non-Muslim friends, mm -hmm. but who have gone through the whole thing, who have circumcised, you see, who have... Uh, uh, said the uh, Shahada, the, the, the creed. Mm -hmm. um, so the, this, this happens on a fairly grand scale. Um, the other scenario is that uh, people genuinely are attracted to Islam, namely because it is a traditional culture. You see, many people don't feel at home in this modern, desolate, urban jungle, or whatever you can bring in against it. But um, there is an alternative, and religious in general used to present that alternative. Only in, in Christianity, in liberal Judaism, you have so much compromise with modernity. Uh, like, say, for instance, you hardly run into any bishop anymore who would dare to gain say anything that a feminist, for example, says. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, in, in, in respect of the interhuman relations, they have totally gone uh, with the modern world, whereas Islam stands firm. Yeah. And so, if, if that's the society you want, where women obey men, for example, then uh, Islam is practically the only alternative. And so that's what quite a few people go for. Hmm. Interesting. Since Islam is truly not compatible with other uh, religions in the world, I think it's the only one I can think of that absolutely is intolerant mm -hmm. of the others. How do we solve this problem? How do we combat this ideology? Yeah, well, um, we have to talk them out of it. <laughs> or, you know, maximize the processes that encourage them in that direction. You see, we don't have to be busybody and, you know, tell them what to do. We only have to make sure that they get scientific education, that they are exposed to other lifestyles, um, that they don't form separate societies and then gradually you see this this outgrowing of Islam will take place on an ever larger scale but that I think is ultimately the solution now since that is a long-term process you may still uh, have quite a few problems with Islam and so there once in a while maybe a tougher solution is necessary 
closing the borders, uh, military intervention. But again, you see, I emphasize, I do not believe in those solutions. You see, there may be emergency measures, sometimes necessary, but that is not really the solution. You see, the solution is to let consciousness evolve, to let them outgrow Islam. That is, for instance, why I am not in favor of uh, Western interventions in Muslim countries. You see, when really your own interests are at stake, well, that, that, that might be defended. But things like, for instance, the French-British-American invasion in Libya, 2011, was a, a complete disaster, a dark cloud without silver lining. Um, and so what the Muslim world needs is a thaw. You see, it's a, it's a relatively peaceful and prosperous situation that is helpful to let the minds evolve. Whereas now you have polarization, which means that everybody puts his heels in the sand and sticks to his own position. Yeah. Interesting. Um, well, I know that you need to get ready for this evening's yeah, presentation. But nevertheless, there is one more thing okay, I want to please, answer to. Please. You, you brought it up. Okay. Um, namely, what happens in a divorce. You see, the uh, Muslim family system is totally geared to maximum procreation. Now, that means, for example, practically, in the case of a divorce, the children automatically go to the father. Now, Maybe the father is not good at doing the laundry and all kinds of other <laughs> chores, but you see, usually you have a kind of joint family, so there'll be an aunt or a sister or whatever, so this child is taken care of, don't worry. Um, but the effect on the mother is that then she has no children anymore. Now, many women, especially those who have had children, are very attached to being a mother, having children. So they have no other option but to start a new family. Moreover, uh, women over here are, have a bit their hands tied on the, the relationship market. Uh, you know, many men don't want a woman who has children of someone else. And um, there you don't have that. You see, their woman is, is, is free, is available for men, and will moreover be eager to start a new family. Mm. So you you know, over here a woman who has two children gets divorced, probably she will never have more than two. Over there she will immediately start having more. So and this is part of a whole philosophy where the family is geared toward towards maximum procreation. And that's of course another side of the Islam situation at present. It is the demographic differential. Islam is growing rather fast. And don't they have something, even here in the States, like 9.3 children per family, and, and, and whereas Americans now, we've reduced ours to 1.2. We can't even sustain, mm -hmm. I think you have to have 2.3 to sustain yeah. society level. So uh, they could overpopulate us here in America in pretty short order at that rate. Well, that's why I'm saying that there is a race going on. There is the time factor is somewhat important. Yeah, yeah. Well, I look forward to hearing you this evening, and um, it should be good. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you for your interest.